Hey everyone, I'm Megan Ferdiber. And my name is Chris Urbanek. We are two physicians who work at East Carolina University and specialize in sports medicine. This is our AFP video series focusing on basic examination and injection techniques for the shoulder. The mnemonic that we like to use whenever going through the shoulder examination is IPASS, standing for inspection, palpation, active passive range of motion, strength, and special tests. Moving on to the physical exam, there's a couple key points that you want to keep in mind. Certainly depending on the history or the injury, you may want to consider doing a cervical exam uh, to rule out potential cervical etiology for their pain. The other key point is that uh, exposure is very important when you're looking at the shoulder. So certainly for males, they're typically more comfortable. You can derobe them completely. For female patients, you may want to consider a holter top uh, or a gown that opens in the back so you can examine the entirety of the posterior shoulder. Um, as we move on to inspection, you certainly want to be able to compare bilaterally. So looking good for asymmetries both in muscle mass or tone, the way that they're carrying the shoulder, or gross abnormalities in bony contours. As we move on to palpation, we have to keep in mind that the shoulder joint is not just the glenohumeral articulation, but it's really four major joints. I like to start my exam at the one that's most commonly missed, midline, at the sternoclavicular joint. Starting medially at the SC joint, you can come across the clavicle, feeling for any bony abnormalities. You can move superiorly into the supraclavicular notch, again feeling for swelling or masses in the inferior clavicular notch as well. If you stay in the inferior clavicular notch, eventually you're going to feel a bony prominence. Uh, this may be tender with pathology at the shoulder as well. You can continue to move laterally as well. And again, as you get to the shoulder, that first bony prominence is going to be the lesser tubercle of the shoulder. You will then feel kind of a thick guitar string type uh, mass. That's the long head of the biceps. Farther laterally is the greater tuberosity of the shoulder. If you go superiorly, at the very end of the clavicle, you get where the clavicle articulates with the acromion, and that's the AC joint. You can then walk across the acromion on the bony prominence, and you're on the spine of the scapula. And those are the major structures of the anterior aspect of the shoulder. We can then continue the exam posteriorly, and you can start laterally as well from the acromion. If you continue to walk back that scapular spine, you'll divide the major rotator cuff muscles posteriorly. There's a suprascapular fossa, which contains supraspinatus muscle. Inferior to that's the infrascapular fossa and infraspinatus, and below that is teres minor. Superficial to all of that is the trapezius muscle, and you can follow that again along up towards the neck. And those are the major posterior shoulder muscles. Uh, we're going to move right on to active and passive range of motion uh, of the shoulder. So I've got my patient right here. What I typically do with my patients whenever I'm going through active and passive range of motion is I have them mimic me. So I'm actually going to step aside here so that we can focus on our patient. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask my patient to go ahead and just copy exactly what I do. So I'm first going to start with forward flexion. So I'm going to have my patient slowly come up into forward flexion. Good. And then I'm going to have her slowly go ahead and come back down. And as you can see, she's reaching her full range. The next thing I'm going to have the patient do is go into full abduction. So we're going to come the whole way, abduct the whole way up. Excellent. And we're going to go ahead and come right back down. Good. And then we're going to externally rotate. The way that I like to describe this to my patients is I would like them to pretend that they have a piece of paper that they're trying to hold right up against the side of their body so it tucks their elbows in nice and tight. Then I'm going to have them watch me and they're going to externally rotate as far as they can. Excellent. Good. And they can go ahead and return back to neutral. So the last range of motion that I would like to go over is full internal rotation. So the way that I describe this to my patient is I'd like her to, to fully reach up to the back of her, of her back as much as she can. Excellent. And what I'm looking for is, first of all, a little bit of symmetry right here. Secondly, she doesn't have any pain with any of this. Now, one thing I do want to make a comment about is if you have a patient who, who is very muscular on one side versus another side, they might not necessarily get the same range of motion on their more muscular side compared to their less muscular, less dominant side. The next thing we're gonna go over is scapular winging and how to evaluate for this. A lot of times I like to have my patient facing the wall and I like to instruct them to go into a slow forward flexion. The patient is usually already familiar with this because we already went through this in our range of motion. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask my patient to slowly go into forward flexion. And what we're doing here is we're we are observing and evaluating her scapula. Go ahead and return back down. 
What you're looking for is you're looking for any significant winging on one scapula versus the other one as the patient is going into forward flexion and then returning back down to a neutral position. Our next section is going to be strength testing for the shoulder. And while it's important to test all of the muscles around the shoulder, biceps, triceps, deltoid, this portion is really going to focus on differentiating the different muscles of the rotator cuff. Um, this can be somewhat tricky, especially because a lot of the strength tests uh, overlap with the special test. They have certain eponyms. And so you will see some of the overlap between the special test and strength testing. So we're going to start to break it down and look at the different strength tests for the individual muscles of the rotator cuff. Uh, I like to start with supraspinatus. And so we're going to have the patient bring their arms up. The plane of motion here is really what we call scaption. It's 30 degrees forward uh, from regular abduction, and then they maximally internally rotate so that they're thumb down. They're going to move their arms uh, towards the ceiling, and you provide resistance, so go ahead and push up against me. And you're comparing bilaterally. You're looking for pain or certainly uh, weakness one side compared to the other. So that's for supraspinatus. Next one's going to be infraspinatus, so you tuck the elbows in at the side. They're going to push out against you. Go ahead and push out and you provide resistance there, again, looking for weakness or pain. Some people will like to kind of preload them either into a little bit of internal rotation or a little bit of external rotation to try to take deltoid out of the picture so that they're entirely doing uh, infraspinatus in, in that position. The next one will be Terry's minor, and so they're going to come up again into that plane of scaption with the elbows at 90 degrees, and again, you can test individually or bilaterally, but you're going to resist external rotation now in this position, so go ahead and push your hand against mine and relax, again, looking for pain or weakness. And then the last one is gonna be the belly press test. Um, and so you have the patient put their fingertips in their belly button, bring their elbows as far forward as possible. This shortens pec to take pec out of the picture. And then you say, don't let me take your hands off your belly. And you again, checking for weakness or pain. And those are manual muscle testing for the muscles of the rotator cuff. Thanks for joining us again. We're gonna go straight into the special tests uh, for the shoulder. So the first special tests that we're gonna go over are going to be tests for the rotator cuff muscle uh, as well as for the biceps tendon. The first test I'm going to go over is going to be the empty can test. This is very similar to the strength testing for the rotator cuff muscles. And you'll see a lot of overlap between the strength testing for rotator cuff muscles and the special tests for them. So what I'm gonna run my patient through is I'm gonna have her go into to abduction to about 90 degrees and in scaption, as we explained in our last video, we explained exactly what that scaption means. The patient's going to be for a little bit forward flex and her arm's going to be in line with her scapula. And then I'm going to have her resist me as I apply a downward pressure. So go ahead and come up. I'm gonna have you hold your hands here and I'm going to apply a downward pressure and resist me. Excellent, good, go ahead and relax. So what I just had my patient do is the empty can test. Now a positive test would be a patient who when they're up in their abduction and I'm applying that downward pressure, they end up having a lot of pain or they end up having a lot of weakness. And that makes me think that there might be something going on with their supraspinatus tendon or their infraspinatus tendon. Next, we're going to go into a few other examinations for the rotator cuff. One of the tests that we like to use to evaluate the rotator cuff is the drop arm test. And it's a very easy test. You can go straight into this from the last test that we just went over, which is the empty can test. So what I'll do is I can bring my patient up passively into a little bit of abduction, and I'll see if my patient's able to hold her arm up. Now, as you can see, our patient's arm immediately fell. She was unable to uh, be able to apply that force and apply that strength to keep that arm up, which is concerning for a rotator cuff tear. The next test I'm gonna go over are external lag tests uh, for the shoulder and for the rotator cuff. Now, I'm going to position my patient in about 90 degrees of abduction, and I'm gonna bring her elbow to about 90 degrees and externally rotate her. I'm gonna bring her back into a little bit more external rotation, and then I'm going to let go, and I'm going to see if she's able to maintain that external rotation. And so my patient has a negative external lag test here. If it were a positive test, her arm would end up falling a little bit more into internal rotation because that muscle, that tendon of the rotator cuff uh, complex would not be intact to keep her into that external rotation. So if we're falling into internal rotation or if that arm is falling down to our side, we're concerned about a tear of the rotator cuff muscles or significant tendinopathy of the rotator cuff. Another version of this would be going into external rotation without going into abduction. So I can passively externally rotate my patient and typically I will compare to her contralateral side. 
and I will let go. And I will see if my patient is able to maintain that external rotation, or if it's a positive test, is she going to fall into a little bit of internal rotation? Now you can compare this to the contralateral side as well, but for demonstration purposes, I'm just using her one side. All right, we're gonna go straight into some of the special tests for our biceps tendon. In particular, we're looking at the long head of the biceps tendon with these special tests. The two that we're gonna talk about and we're going to demonstrate are going to be Speed's test and Jurgensen's test. So we're gonna start with Speed's test. I'm going to have my patient go into full forward flexion right here, stop at about 90 degrees with an open palm. I'm going to apply a downward force here and my patient is going to resist me. What I'm looking for here is pain, and in particular pain right along the area of that biceps tendon in its bicipital groove. So go ahead and relax. Next test we're gonna go over is Jurgensen's test. Now I'm gonna show you one way to do this with a variation on it. Jurgensen's test is a test where the examiner is going to resist the patient while the patient is trying to supinate. So we're going to demonstrate. I'm gonna have my patient at 90 degrees at her elbow, and I'm gonna pretend like I'm shaking her hand right here. I'm gonna have her supinate almost as if she's doing a biceps curl and I'm going to resist her. So go ahead and try to supinate, good. And I'm resisting her at this point. What you're looking for is you're looking for pain right along that biceps tendon. Now there's a variant to this where I'm gonna have my patient resist me, so she's gonna to try to supinate again. And I'm going to externally rotate her while I'm doing this. What I'm feeling for is not only whether or not the patient has pain at the long head of the biceps, but I'm also looking to see if she's having any subluxation of that tendon outside of that bicipital groove. That can also cause a patient a lot of pain in this anterior aspect of their shoulder. So we're going to be covering more special tests. These are going to be looking at some of the impingement tests as well as AC joint pathology. The first one that we're going to be looking at is the Hawkins-Kennedy test for subacromial impingement. This one is done with uh, bringing up the arm to about 90 degrees of flexion. You can bend the elbow and then you're essentially just going to internally rotate in this position. You'll see some modifications where they'll kind of really crank on the arm or start to bring it across. But if you get into this position and really internally rotate them, you're going to be looking for pain kind of generally across the anterior shoulder. And this is again a special test for subacromial impingement. Our other subacromial impingement test is Nears test. And this where you internally rotate at the shoulder and bring them up into frontal flexion, looking again for that general anterior shoulder pain as you get towards the end ranges of frontal flexion. Our last test is for AC joint pathology towards the superior aspect of the shoulder. You're gonna bring them into frontal flexion to about 90 degrees, and then just AD duct horizontally across the body. This is also somewhat called the scarf test as the arm is making a scarf across the neck. It's important to note where their pain is in this position because this can also be positive in cases of rotator cuff tendinopathy or subacromial impingement. So you want to note if their pain is occurring right at the AC joint or if they're getting that interlateral or posterior lateral pain with some of the other conditions. And so those are some of our special tests for the shoulder. We're going to go straight into a few more special tests for the shoulder. In particular, we're going to look at tests that evaluate for shoulder stability and also a special test for the shoulder labrum. So first, I'm going to go over the apprehension test, and I'm going to follow this up with Job's relocation test. So what I'd like to do for this is I like to have my patient laying down supine with their shoulder nearly off the side of the table. I like this position because her scapula is nice and stabilized against the back part of the table. I get my patient into about 90 degrees abduction. I get her elbow into about 90 degrees of flexion, and I maximally externally rotate her, and I apply a little bit of pressure here. Now, what I'm looking for isn't exactly pain, although this could be a little bit uncomfortable for patients. What I'm looking for is for the patient to be apprehensive about this position. So patients who have ever had any shoulder dislocation or have had a shoulder subluxation incident in the past might feel quite apprehensive with this. If that is the case, what I'd like to do is I'd like to follow up that exam with Job's relocation test, where I apply my hand around that anterior capsule of the shoulder, reinforcing it so that when I bring them into external rotation, they don't have that same sensation of apprehension. So next we're gonna go over O'Brien's test. O'Brien's test is classically supposed to test the labrum of the shoulder. However, a lot of times, it's very tough to test just one part of the shoulder with a single test. It's better to use this test in combination with other tests to figure out the etiology of your patient's pain. So to run through O'Brien's test, I'm going to ask my patient to go ahead and get herself into forward flexion to 90 degrees. I'm gonna have her line up her thumb with her nose, and I'm gonna have her resist me as I apply a downward force. Excellent, that's part one of O'Brien's test. The second part is I'm gonna have my patient
rotate so that her thumb is pointing downward and with her hand still in line with her nose. Now I'm going to again apply a downward force and I'm going to have her resist me. Good. Go ahead and relax. A positive O'Brien's test is when your patient has pain with their thumb down and while they're resisting you as you're applying that downward force. However, this patient will not have pain with the thumb up and the examiner applying a downward pressure while the patient is pushing up. So only pain with the thumb down, no pain with the thumb up. And that would be a positive O'Brien's test. For the final part of our video series, we're going to be covering common landmark guided injections that you should feel comfortable doing in the office. The first one's going to be the subacromial injection. So certainly for educational purposes, we're not going to actually be doing injections. I have a blunted needle tip, and uh, as you're doing this in the office, you're going to follow universal cautions and gloves and uh, cleaning approaches. Uh, as far as identifying your landmarks for procedure, uh, bony landmarks are going to be your starting point. You can walk all the way to the lateral edge of the acromion and then kind of using your thumb as you come posteriorly, you'll come into this first little divot of the bone just posterior to the acromion. That's essentially where you're going to uh, start your injection for the subacromial approach. And so typically you want to mark that uh, however you typically do. I, I tend to use my pen without uh, any ink to it, so I'm making just a divot into the skin and that's my approach for the injection. Uh, the angle for my injection is going to be towards the coracoid process, just underneath the acromion posteriorly. If you use ink or a skin marking pen, the concern is as you pass your needle through that, you can tattoo the skin, so that's why we don't put any, any ink into this area. You're then going to go through your typical routine for cleaning the skin, whether it's chlorhexidine or betadine, whatever you typically go through, and then you set up for your injection, whatever you would typically use. In this case, we have a, a blunted needle and a, an empty syringe. As I said before, the approach is through your marked area, aiming essentially towards the coracoid process. I tend to keep my other hand there during this so that I have an approach. Uh, as we've already cleaned, you then aim towards your other finger. Um, in this instance, again, you're just deep to the acromion. You can pass your needle uh, uh, through as long as you're not meeting resistance, and then you go ahead and inject your injectate. Whenever you're done, obviously the needle comes out, you apply a sterile bandage, and then you're done. I tend to use a little bit of a larger gauge needle. Um, typically about a 22, uh, as opposed to a 25 or a 27 where you're going to get some inherent resistance from the needle itself. You want to make sure that you're not injecting into the tendon, and with a smaller gauge needle that resistance can sometimes fool you, whereas with the 22 there's not much resistance to it, and as long as you're uh, injecting freely, you know that you're not doing an intratendinous injection. And that's our approach for a subacromial injection. Our next injection is going to be for the AC joint, and this can be useful for a lot of different pathologies, whether it's AC joint arthropathy, distal clavicle osteolysis, or AC chronic pain after an AC separation. Uh, the first thing, like all of our injections, is going to be identifying your landmarks. Um, and the nice thing with this one is we're using pretty prominent bony landmarks. You can start with the clavicle medially and working your way laterally. And if you just continue to follow the clavicle, uh, you may find that uh, divot that represents the AC joint pretty prominent on most people. If you're struggling with that, you can also start laterally and identify the acromion and then start to work medially until you get to the clavicle. And again, you're going to find that same spot that represents the AC joint. Once you have that, you can mark just like we've done before, right where the AC joint, which is going to be your target for the injection. Your approach is going to be right into the joint line. And you can do this superiorly. And you can kind of identify if certain people have arthritis or osteophytes within the joint, whether you're going to go a little bit more anterior or posterior, but basically you can go at it with an anterior, roughly 45 degree approach or so. You're going to clean the skin in the usual fashion and then using an appropriately sized needle, typically about a 25, enter the joint with your needle. Aspirate to make sure you're not in a vessel and then go ahead and plunge the needle to uh, inject whatever injectate you might be using. Remove the needle and then go ahead and clean the skin. And that's your AC joint injection. The last injection that we're going to cover is a biceps tendon sheath injection, which is occasionally done for biceps tendinopathy. This is done again by first identifying our landmarks. Within the tubercular groove, you can identify kind of that large guitar string structure, which is the biceps tendon. And you first identify the really most tender aspect of it, and that's going to be your target. What I like to do is I, I really make two marks. One is the area that's most tender, and again on that string, I'll make my first mark. That's my target. And knowing that I'm going to be injecting at a bit of an angle and the structure is not right at the skin, I then step down, usually about a centimeter and a half or two centimeters, and that's going to be the entry point for my needle. I then go through and knowing that that's my entry point, clean the skin in our typical fashion, and then get a um, 
obviously size appropriate needle with whatever my injectate is going to be. I use the two marks because I need to know that I have a, a, a direction for my needle. And at about a 30 degree angle, I'm going to enter the skin and continue to pass down until I get some resistance from the tendon itself. At that point, I usually pull back a little bit to make sure that I'm not into the tendon, aspirate to make sure there's no vessel, and then inject whatever injectate I might be using. Needle can then be withdrawn, clean the skin, cover with a sterile bandage, and you've done your injection for a long head biceps tendon. This concludes our video series. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay tuned for our next series.